Ready.
Thank you, Claudia. Good morning, Royal Palm Church. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Greetings to those of you out there on Facebook tuning in. We're thankful for the fine work of Chris Kemp and Kathy Myron for making it possible for us to broadcast. I'm Pastor Jonathan Jones, along with Dr. Joe Weiner here. We're bringing the message this morning. We are gathered in, with uh, Dr. Erickson Rojas and uh, Claudia Vining and the Clifford's here to, to share their violin music, and we have just a wonderful service. We are thankful that we're gathered um, each Sunday here at Royal Palm Church at Lake Worth, um, Jog, and Hypoluxa Road, for those of you out there who don't know where we are just yet. Well, it's <laughs> Valentine's Day, so of course I put my red shirt on, and you can't see it, this, <laughs> this black robe. Everywhere, people are celebrating love and uh, what it means to be to be loved. But I think many people don't really know what love really is these days. But we do, because we have Jesus. Jesus Amen. loves us. And that's, in fact, why we're gathered this very day. I love the, the hymn, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as the mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of thy love. We know what it is to be loved by Jesus. And so we are gathered together to worship him. So I turn your attention to the call to worship, which is found in your bulletin there. It's responsive. I'll read the light text and you can respond with the bold. Come, give thanks with your whole heart. Sing praises to God. Worship the living God. For his loving kindness and his truth, because he has set his word above his awesome name. Thank him, because in the day of trouble, he answered and encouraged us when we prayed, and he strengthened our soul. Though Jehovah is great and high above all, yet he cares for the lowly, but he makes the haughty ones stand at a distance. When we walk in the very midst of trouble, the Lord sustains us. He stretches out his hand against those who are our fierce enemies. Jehovah will bring to completion everything he has planned for me. His loving kindness endures forever. For this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. And a special Valentine's Day welcome. I'm so glad to see you here. If you're watching on television or whatever it is, live stream, uh, remember that the camera always makes me look fatter than I really am. <laughs> Other than that, we're glad that you're here today. A special welcome to wonderful friends who've been away for a long time. Uh, Alberta Dorhout is here today, and Robin Andrews is here today, and if you've been away, a ah, cordial welcome to you too. And if you've just come in and you're a visitor, wow, we are so glad to see you. We don't make you do funny things. But because this is a, you know, this is a special day, this is Valentine's Day, I'm not sure everybody knows who, who St. Valentine was. He was uh, a minister of the gospel back in the third century, or I think in the year 223, and died in the year 272. He was martyred, his head was chopped off for this reason. The Emperor Claudius II was persecuting the church and he did not want any Christian men in his army to care about anybody but himself. So he forbade marriage to the Christians. And Valentine, believing in traditional marriage that we still believe in, traditional marriage, children are fine but they've got to come after marriage. And he believed in that, so he was secretly marrying people, but it came to the emperor's knowledge, they, they chopped off his head. So we've always remembered St. Valentine's Day, and it's celebrated in most countries, except certain countries of Islam. They do not allow Valentine's Day, no giving of red hearts or anything like that. But we have lots of red hearts around here because we think it's an important thing. The heart represents love. So that's, that's one of the wonderful things about Valentine's Day. Now also, uh, in your bulletin, uh, or on the face of your bulletin, there's a, a picture here. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but for now, just take a look at it. And you can't see it because the image is somewhat blurred, but this sweet little couple, it's a wonderful couple, and she's trying to tie a, a white armband on his arm, and he is not allowing her to do it. You can't see it if I gave you a, a blow up of that, you could see it. But uh, she's trying to protect him. 
uh, for a certain reason, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But for now, because it's Valentine's Day, everybody needs love, everybody wants love, I think. And the most sovereign, the most wonderful love of all is to know that we are loved by Almighty God. Some people, it does not matter. But with some people, it is a big thing. So if you open your bulletin there, you'll see inside where the birthdays are, the little chorus that, you, that, that we like to sing around here every once in a while. And it's okay to do this. Let me call you sweetheart. I'm in love with you. Let's sing that wonderful romantic song about marital love. What are, we, what are we waiting for? Oh, it's a cappella. Fire up. Oh, my They're all fire. No, 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 no. no. We, we take care of our musicians because they cover when the sermon's lousy. <laughs> all right, let me call you sweetheart. Let me call you sweetheart. I'm in love with you. Let me hear you whisper that you love me too. Keep the love light going in your eyes so true. Let me call you sweetheart. I'm in love with you. Do it one more time now. I think you've got it. Let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love. Let me hear you whisper that you love me too. Keep the love light glowing in your eyes so true. Let me call you sweetheart. done wonderfully well and you have YouTube go put in there let me call you a sweetheart and then pull up the name Liberace <laughs> and you'll hear it and I thought I sent that to Erickson but evidently I did all right uh, okay here we go we've got some wonderful songs to sing today and the first one is number 508 love lifted me 508 <laughs> Thank you. 
evidence of God's love, and He loves us. Sing, souls in danger look upon Jesus. sing the song 314 what wondrous love is this oh my soul oh my soul as we look into what kind of love is in the heart of God to love us singing it to that great tune, the Austrian tune.
Pray with me. Almighty Father, by your word you have established the world, and it will not be moved. For your decrees, they are trustworthy. Lord Jesus, you are exalted King over all of it, robed in majesty and strength. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the earth and all who dwell in it for you, O Christ, come to judge the world with righteousness and equity. Holy Spirit, you have comforted us as an infant whose mother comforts him, for you have made us alive to our Lord and Savior Jesus. So we rejoice because of you, triune God. We bless you. We praise you, worship and adore you, who alone are worthy. We thank you, Father, that you have answered our prayers for Jesus' sake. Although you are high and lifted, you regard the lowly. Even as we walk through the midst of many troubles, you preserve our lives and fulfill your good purposes. Thank you that your steadfast love endures forever. We are grateful that you abide in us. You have borne much fruit so that our joy may be made full. You have been patient with us, and your patience, it brings us to repentance. So we confess to you our transgressions and sins. We confess that though you have given us much good, we have not always lived in gratitude for it, but we have coveted what you've given to others. And in unbelief, you have, we have taken for granted your kindness. We admit that your, especially your people, in this land we have embraced the ways of an unbelieving nation and humbled ourselves before the idols made with our hands. We have not feared you nor heeded your holy law. We have been faithless, slow to obey, and quick to blame others for our own trespasses. Father, have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. Pardon our iniquities, forgive our sins as we hide ourselves, in the wounds of our Savior. And Spirit of God, please wash us, clean us on our consciences that we might be sanctified, useful instruments of the grace that you've shown. And now intercede for us as we offer these petitions. Bless your church in this day. Give us boldness of faith. Fill us with godly patience as the prophets exhibited before us that we might bear faithful witness of your love with endurance. Take from the godless the deceit of their self-assurance. Awaken men to the stench of their sin before you. Break their hearts that they might bow before Jesus, the only one who saves. Have mercy on those who are suffering, especially for those who suffer for the sake of the gospel, but also for those who are living in want. Please provide for the needs of your church here, Royal Palm Church. Guide us by your wisdom. Strengthen those who are sick by your mighty hand. Bring the joy and hope of heaven to those who are saddened by life's many griefs. And soften our hearts now to hear and believe your word as, as it is preached by your servant, Joe. And now we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we have... A special responsive reading comes from the book of Corinthians, chapter 13, that most knowable of uh, all passages about love, so fitting for today. And we've uh, charted it out as a responsive reading, so I'll read the, the light text there on the back. You'll find it on the back of your bulletin there, and, uh, I'll, and you respond with the bold. This is the word of the Lord. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy 
and I understood all God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Together. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God. Blessed to your hearing. This morning there's just a few announcements to share with you. Of course, I think you were probably caught as you, you came in. We have a, a wonderful uh, opportunity for a ladies' brushes, bites, and beverages coming up on <laughs> March 20th. You can find all about that out there in the Narthex. It's, it's a painting party, uh, a fundraiser, and uh, see Nancy or, or Claudia for details about that, but that sounds wonderful. Man, I'm not sure what we're going to do to rival that. <laughs> uh, or should we even try? Uh, I should note that although the, the bulletin does say that men's uh, fellowship breakfast is tomorrow, it's not tomorrow, but in fact next Monday. So just so you're, in case you're, you're counting your dates and trying to plan ahead, uh, keep that in mind. Of course, we've initiated our, our drive for the, the Eagles Club. And for all of those of you who are, who are able, you may have been blessed with um, something that the Lord has given you and um, you want to be a good steward of that, we ask that you consider becoming part of the Eagles Club. During the, the summer months, uh, all churches, but especially a church that is seasonal like down here in Florida, we, we need extra support. And so we ask that you would consider that, even those of you who are out there watching on live stream, consider uh, supporting the work of, of Christ here at Royal Palm. Um, normally, at this time, we pass out plates and have a, take up an offering. We won't do that, um, but instead we will have a musical offering, and I pray that it will be a blessing to you.
doxology in praise of our God. Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you teach us more about his lovely name? Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for this wonderful music we have enjoyed today. Amen. I'm so thankful Thank that we have a singing congregation. If you're one that you say, well, I don't have a singing voice, but uh, you can. You can try, and, and, and we, we all love one another, so... No matter how badly you sing, we think it's good. <laughs> Presbyterians don't always know what good hymn singing is anyway, so it, it all sounds good to me when I hear you, and, and I'm thankful. If you're visiting today, welcome. We're glad that you're here. It's my turn to open the word for us this morning. Uh, but before I do, I have to tell you that um, I saw this and I thought it was cute. The, the, uh, the couple, now up in years, sleeping in bed, she turned to him and she said, I dreamed last night. He said, I dreamed too. And she said, I dreamed I was at Walmart. And he said, well, I dreamed that I was with three women and we were having such a wonderful time. And she said, was I one of them? He said, no, you were at Walmart. <laughs> Again, the word of God from our Lord Jesus Christ, who is love embodied, love who has come down. He is the very essence of love. From John chapter 15. Now, this is the night in which our Lord is going to go to the cross. He knows what lies before him, and yet he says these words to them. He says to these disciples who are all worried about it, he says, that, that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so do I. And then he said, let's go hence. And so they come now towards the garden. And he says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. That it may bear more fruit. If you're here in the chapel this morning, you're looking behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and you see what our gardener has done to our beautiful tree, our monksbury tree, and it looks terrible. It looked, but it has to because it's going to, it's being pruned, and in a few weeks it'll have little sprouts on it, and suddenly it'll come out these most beautiful, gorgeous purple flowers. And we will all say, "It looked terrible a while ago, but look at it now." May I tell you something? If you look at the life of Christians and you look at your own life, you may say. Oh, wow, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. And the Lord just says, no, but just wait. I'm pruning. I'm pruning. And you have no idea what you will be like. It will be beautiful. And so our Lord Jesus says, now you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And the idea is you're already, you're already clean. The Greek word there is cathartic. It's a strange word. It's used really in medicine, sometimes meaning as a laxative and it just means thoroughly purged and Jesus says now you are in the sight of God thoroughly purged what does he mean well he's given you his righteousness is the free gift it's yours it's to your credit right now not your own but his righteousness he said now you're clean because of the word I've spoken to you abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For without me, apart from me, you can do nothing. And then he says this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
You will ask what you desire and it shall be done to you. Why? Because you're abiding in Christ. You're not going to ask for other things that are foolish. Or you submit them to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not sure whether or not I should do this or not, but it might be a foolish thing. But you bring everything to the Lord and you give him the last refusal. He can say yes or no or wait. Or are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so shall you be my disciples. As, here's the text, as the Father has loved me, as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. You could put a little equal sign in there. As the Father has loved me, equally I have loved you. And then he says, abide in my love. And then he says this, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he says, my commandment is this. This is the commandment. Oh, it's a terrible, terrible commandment. That you love one another. That you love one another. You do everything that is good to help. Because love is the essence. We just read about it. All those wonderful, incidentally, what you read in 1 Corinthians 13 is just the personification of our Lord Jesus' character. He's all those things. Is he patient? Yes. Is he kind? Yes. He's all those things. Does he keep a record of him? No. He's all of those things. Now, before I, I, I have time to do this, I want to take a look at the front of the bulletin here, because here you see love, a great loving concern. And there are four little pictures in there that take us through the realm of life as we love one another. The first of all, this was painted by a wonderful painter, and his name was... Uh, John Everett uh, Millet, he was French, he painted it uh, in 1542, I think, something like that, no, in 18 something. But he was thinking about a young couple and he wanted to show a picture of love. And one of his friends said to him, well, it's just a couple, you've got to do something to make it stand out. So he went back and he thought about it. Being a Frenchman, there was an episode that took place and he wrote about this daring couple you see, the little girl there is a Catholic. And this is, the painting is called the Huguenot. Huguenots were another name for Protestants. But the, the fellow she loves is a Protestant. And something is going to happen that the Catholics were told in France. They were told what was going to happen on the 14th of August in, uh, in this year of 18, I think it was 1842 or 72, there would be there would be an uprising to relief the land and release the land from the influence of the Protestants who were back to the Bible and not interested in religion of popery. And so every Catholic was told to wear a white armband. And here she's trying to tie a white armband on her Protestant lover to save him from the persecution that she knew was coming. Maybe she told him about it, and maybe he said, I, don't, I just don't see it, I don't think it's going to happen. Something that dastardly, that would never happen. But it did. On the Feast of St. Bartholomew, 2,000 people, Protestants, were murdered in Paris. Did you? I don't know that you knew that, but history is a wonderful thing to know because it helps us to avoid mistakes. 2,000 people were murdered Many are in their beds in, in, in Paris. 20,000 Protestants were murdered throughout all of France. And so France lost the witness of the word for years and years and years. And so I put that in there because it tells a story. It tells a story of great love and great concern. And it's something that we should know. Now I'm happy to say that in this land of the free and home of the brave, and we're celebrating President's Day this weekend, and tomorrow is President's Day, this land, our closest neighbor is our Catholic brothers down the street. And nobody's killing anybody. Why? Because of the essence of what made America great. It was the founding fathers and the freedom of religion. Not permission to be religious, but freedom of religion, to practice your religion. And so uh, I put that picture on there. But then here's the story. We're talking about marriage and love, which is uh, marriage is the epitome of love. Not everybody is called to be married. The Apostle Paul tells us that. But many people, ordinarily, uh, marriage is the way to go. 
And so here you have up in the upper left-hand corner as they're growing older. And I love, I love the Robert Browning's little poem that he has that you get married in the sunshine of your life, early years. You know, God, God gave the young people children because he knew that they could handle them better than old people can. Uh, we, don't, we don't handle children very well. But here, here they're out there and they're enjoying life. And too many times we quit living too early and we need to keep on living as long as we can. So here's this couple out on the beach and they're dancing. And it's the old story, grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. Is that true? Yes, like good wine, it's aged. And it's aged. And if your marriage is anything, it ages. Grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. So here they are in the, in the wonderful time of life. And maybe they're taking cruises and they're going to the islands and they're seeing all the things of the world. But they're joyful. Those are the great years of life. And we all, if you're married, you know you've had those. But then there comes a time when we, we really feel the effect of age. And so we pray and say, Lord, bring healing. And sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. But it's interesting for me to realize that Christ Jesus never said we would escape all of the, all of the effects of the original Adamic curse. The world, the whole world still lies under the curse. And so every sound of nature is in a minor tone. Even the chirping of the birds, it's minor, it's not major. Most religion songs are in the minor. Now, minor is very strong, and I like to hear it sometimes, like once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. So many songs are in the minor key, but most of Christian songs are in the major keys. Love lifted me. And so these are the wonderful benefits of being a Christian. But we do, we experience, we experience heartache and sickness and sadness. And we experience disease and because God has warned the world and not heeding his warning, the whole world fell under the curse. And so men <laughs> toil for everything that they, that they have. And the earth has its thorns and its thistles. And it waits and we wait because we still find a lot of imperfection in us. And we find these things that happen in life that require help from doctors and friends who love us. And sometimes it's not just the physical things, sometimes it's the spiritual things and the emotional things. We need support. We need one another. That's why Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another. Now, having looked at St. Valentine's Day, considering that this is also President's Day, now let us look and just see the title of the message is The Story of Three Loves. And it's the love that Jesus tells us about that we have never scratched beneath the surface of it. He said, as the Father has loved me. Now there are those religions in the world known as polytheistic, meaning many, many gods. Uh, and we are not one of those. We, don't, we believe there's only one God. But then there are those who are monotheistic and they divide into two groups. One is those who believe that God is a single one. That would be Islam and Judaism. God is just one God. And there's no, no within his personality, there's no division. But it was Jesus Christ, God's son, who now brings to light all those passages in the Old Testament that hinted to the fact that within the Godhead, there are three persons of the same substance, equal in power, equal in glory, and each one loves the other, each one serves the other, each one has an office to fulfill. And that is within the one Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we've given them these names. Actually, we speak of the first person of the Godhead, the second person of the Godhead, third person of the Godhead. But we say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So within the Godhead, there are these three persons. Now, if God was just a monotheistic oneness, and we say God is loved, then whom did he love? And it wouldn't make sense, because love always seeks an object. And so we say, no, there, within the Godhead, there are three persons. Now, one of the scriptures that is so important to Judaism and to Christianity is known as the Shema, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, Adonai, 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 Achud. The last word, Achud. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Adonai, Eloheinu. Adonai, Achud. There are two words for the word one. 
One is Achud. The other is Yahid. The Yahid is a single one. But a Yahud is a united one. And it's used to marriage. A husband and a wife. And they come together. And the blending of these two, the Bible says, and they two shall be one. And so within the Godhead, there is this division of an Ahud. We speak about, I'll have a, uh, a bunch of grapes. It's one bunch of grapes, but there are many grapes within the bunch. And so in the Bible, we're told that God is more than just a single one. He is a united one. So who is it that Adam talked to when he walked through the garden? Adam and Eve. And wasn't that a wonderful thing how God shared his love, made Adam and Eve? He made Adam and he says, not good for the man should be alone. Not good that the man should be a yachid. He needs to be an achud. And so God made Eve. And you know those first words, but the word for man in the Bible is ish. Ish is the Hebrew word man. And when Adam saw Eve, God gave us a new word. He said, isha. Isha. <laughs> wow. That's what he said. Isha. And what a wonderful, wonderful life they had. They sinned and then God covered their sin and redeemed them by the blood of the lamb that they offered. And so we believe that we'll see them in heaven. How, well, how will I know who they are? How will you know who Adam and Eve are? Look for the ones without a navel. <laughs> they don't have any belly button. They'll be the ones in heaven. That'll be, a, that'll be our mother and our father, Adam and Eve. And then, and then down through history, God has blessed them. And so he continues to tell and reveal them. So who did they talk to in the cool of the garden? They talked to Jesus before he came to earth. He was the second person of the Godhead who reveals the Father. Now there's something else that's so wonderful, and that is about our salvation. Paul talks about marriage as being a type of a, of a mystery, and it is a really mystery. How <laughs> two people who, who come together, and, and now they have to be one, and it takes a lot of give and take. Uh, in order for this to happen and to be a happy home. And they cannot be submitted to each other until they are first submitted to God. And when you submit to God, he gives you the grace to submit one to the other, to love one another with a, with a self-deprecating love, anything that you can do to love one another. And so when, when God made us, as the Father has loved me, he said, so have I loved you, continue in my love. Now, I, I told you a little bit about the Huguenot situation and all that. Simon and Garfunkel, they sang a song one time years ago, back in the 60s, and I loved that song. And the theme was, I am a rock. I'm an island. Now, what's the difference between a, because a rock, they said, feels no pain, and an island never cries. So in this world, the sunlight of God's love comes into the world. And I want to ask this question for the folks who are here, and I know you already know the answer, but I want to ask of those who may be watching, does it matter to you whether or not God loves you? Does it matter? Because there's a whole host of people for whom it doesn't matter. They just live their lives and they just say it doesn't matter. The son of one of our great presidents said, that he didn't believe in God and he dared God and he enjoined God to send him to hell because he didn't believe in hell, didn't believe in God. How foolish that is to take such a chance like that. But it didn't matter. Now when the sunlight comes out of the heavens to the rock, what does it do? It does nothing, it heats the rock. The rock absorbs the heat, but it feels nothing. A rock feels no pain, it's just a rock. But that same sunlight by photosynthesis that God made, not only heats the rock, but it causes a flower to grow. So here one time in our lives, we were rocks. Our hearts were stony towards God. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Well, what did he have to do? What did he have to do to show that love? He has to somehow change the heart, change the rock, so that it will absorb the spiritual photosynthesis of grace and being renewed, it will now be able to be soft and pliable and grow. And this is the miracle of what we call the new birth. Ezekiel talks about it. God says, your, your heart is stony, it's rock. I pour out grace upon you, but you just absorb it, that nothing happens because you're a rock. 
A rock is dead. It feels nothing, does nothing. It just, it's just there taking up space until the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. And what does he do? He says, I'll do surgery on you. I'll take out of you that old rocky heart and I'll put a new heart within you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. He takes this stony heart out of us and he puts a new heart of flesh in us. And now what do we find? Now I can be what he made me to be. A recipient of God's love and God's grace, God's forgiveness. It's all in that word love. What is love? What is the fruit of the spirit? It is love. Now some people say there are seven fruits of the No, 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 no. They're not seven or eight, nine fruits. Of There's only one fruit of the spirit. It's love. And the rest of them are just describing what that love is. Love is patience. Love is kind. Love is gentle. Love, long serving. Patience. All these things. That's just describing what love is. So if I were to ask you, do you love? You'd have to say, well, does it matter to you whether or not God loves you? To some people it doesn't. But only to those to whom God does this special surgical operation do they say, yes, it matters. I want to be loved by God. In fact, I need to be loved by God. In fact, I must be loved by God for my life to be anywhere near complete. And so then what? Then he shows us the cross. He shows us Jesus who is love incarnate. He shows us the Lord Jesus who is the Father revealed. Show us the Father and that will satisfy us. Oh, Philip, have I been so long time with you and hast thou not known me? He who sees me hath seen the Father. Everything you see in Jesus is exactly like the Father. Now don't get me wrong. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for religion. Religion probably sent more people to hell than anything I know. But Christianity is not religion. Religion is just, a, it, oh, I, I take that back. Religion is part of Christianity. It's, it's the teachings. Those are the outside. Those are the husks. But inside is the corn. And many people are stuck with just the husks, the vocabulary. But they've never known what it's like to have the inside, the real fruit, the real corn of what religion is supposed to be. I watched the man go like this. Made the sign of the cross to bless himself. Uh, I'm thankful for that. And I, I'm not judging. But you make the sign of the cross saying, I, I am a believer. And then with a stroke of the pen, he signed the death warrant for millions of unborn children. The state of Ohio has just passed a rule that the unborn child is a person. Before Hitler could ever... Before Hitler could ever kill the Jews in Germany, the Supreme Court of Germany first declared them as non-persons. But we are people. Amen. And so the love of God is also, it's not only good, it's righteous, but it changes people's hearts. And if, if you only come to the outside, it's nothing. Let me give you an illustration. The three words in the Bible for love, and then I close my lesson here. I, I probably have confused you completely anyway. <laughs> There are three words in the Bible for love. Actually, there's four, but I only use three of them. One is eros, one is phileo, and one is agapapo. Now, the eros love, that's that couple in bed that just got married. Oh, it's hot and furious. It's wonderful. <laughs> There's the two becoming one, and God bless them. God doesn't care if you get your kicks hanging from a chandelier. <laughs> but, he, that's, that's, but that's to be reserved. The Bible says in Hebrews, the bed is undefiled. The bed is undefiled in marriage. Outside of marriage, it is cursed. Now, so he says, the bed is undefiled. So now that's the word eron. And here's what it is. She is the captain uh, of the cheerleaders. And he is the captain of the football team. And she's in love with him. And doesn't he look good? Oh, he looks almost wonderful. And so they get married, but it's only based on the surface part of physical love, physical attraction. And if you look at this picture down in any one of them, that physical attraction doesn't last. After a while, we have problems. And so if you're always looking for the satisfaction of sexual completeness, you're not going to be complete. How many movie stars do you know? How many millionaires do you know? who have not found the completeness. They're unhappy with everything that you and I think would make us happy. 
They say money won't make you happy. I know money won't make you happy, but I'd like to try to prove it. <laughs> anyway, and so now, so that's erotic love. And after a while, it fades away as we get older. And life takes on a new meaning, new dimensions. Now the other love, phileo love, that's a wonderful love. Jesus speaks about that. He says, scarcely for a righteous man will one day not his life. And that's the love of a, of a soldier who falls on the grenade. Or that's the love of, of people are married. If you're not a Christian, you're most likely married on the basis of phileo love, which is this. I love you because you love me. The condition of my love is because you return my love. I love you because you love me. But if you stop loving me, what happens? I stop loving you. So it's, it's, it's a good love. It's a strong love. But the third love is this, agapao. And it's the love that's reserved only for God and Christians. God says, I don't love you because you sexually excite me. And I don't love you because you love me because you didn't. I've made up my mind, the mind of God, to set my love upon you. And once I make up my mind to set my love upon you, that's where it says, for better, for worse, for sickness and health, for richer or for poorer. I've set my mind upon you. And once I've made up my mind to love you, all hell and brown's mules cannot stop that love. And that's why those who are truly born again are secure. They will never fall away. Oh, they may sin and they may fall from grace, but they never fall out of grace. And the love of God will capture them and eventually bring them back. And so those people are brought to God by this agape love. And here's what it is. John 3.16 uses this love. For God so loved not just Israel. See, see, Nicodemus thought it was just little Israel that God loved. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God says this, I chose you, Israel, not because you were many, not because you were mighty, you were, you were weak, you were nothing. But I chose you, and then it says this, I chose to set my love on you. God made up his mind to set his love on this people. And Ezekiel tells us the same thing. God chooses to send his love upon us. And so when he chooses to set his love upon us, nothing will take that love from us. The main thing is to make sure that we have received that love. Now let me say this. How does God communicate this love? This is the most fantastic thing in the world. To conquer another nation, you need might and power and strength. But to change somebody, you need to coerce. How does God do it? He doesn't use any of those things. The word, W-O-R-D, that's by the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the good news, the preaching of the word. And here's what the word does. First, the wrecking crew has to go before the construction crew. He has to remind you that apart from God's grace, you're just absorbing the light but doing nothing because you're a dead rock. But the word also tells you that God can change the heart. God is willing to change the heart. Christ is willing to love you. And so then you begin to seek him. And when you say, it matters to me whether he loves me or not. It matters to me. I, and if it does, then you're going to begin to do the things that he likes. The things that he loves. That will not save you. But as you begin that, that new road, that new life, and you're trying to obey, you realize that you come short. And then you're going to say, God... I can't do it. And he will say, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so God gives you the blessing of salvation. What did you contribute to it? Nothing. Grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. Mm. G-R-A-C-E, grace. Mm. It's everything for those who deserve the exact opposite. Mm. Do you have it? I don't ask if you have religion. I don't care about all this. Hell's filled with people who can do all sorts of things. They can quote the Bible. You know who knows the Bible better than the preacher? Well, you say anybody. You know who knows the Bible better than anybody I know or anybody you know? The devil. Mm. The devil knows it word for word. The devil's a great expositor of the scripture. When he tempted Jesus, he used scripture to tempt him. Mm. 
and to test him. And so the Bible tells us, Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, when did the love for the Son begin? In eternity past. It began in eternity past. The Father and the Son always love one another. The Son and the Spirit and the Holy Ghost and, uh, and the Father, they love one another. It is the essence of it. It's a fountain of love. And, and now it, love expresses itself in creating a world. And in that world, he said that men may know me in my power, I will make a great world. And so he spoke the word. God speaks the word and it happens. But when he went to save the world, a spoken word would not suffice. So he sent the one who is the living word, Jesus. Mm. And was he crushed? Yes. He was crushed on the cross. He had our rock nature, human nature yet without sin, but he was crushed on the cross. I am a worm and no man. There on the cross, he was crushed that the life that is in him might be given to us freely. And so we receive it by grace through faith. That's the gospel. Now, remember this. The sign of that is that you love one another. I don't do it perfectly. And the other thing I need to tell you is this. You can't love other people if you don't begin to love yourself. You've got to begin to love yourself. You've got to begin to see yourself as an object of God's love, not because you deserved it, but you've got it. And it's a wonderful thing to have. And so now you can share it. You can afford to do it. One time I, I gave a gift to somebody and uh, they never said thank you. And it, it bothered me for a while. And then I realized I didn't give it to say, get a thank you. I gave it because I love them. And that's what love is. You give whether you get a reciprocal thing or not. You, you love and that's the essence of God's love. And now he wants us to love one another. So where does it begin? It begins in the house of God. And Paul uses the illustration of marriage in Ephesians 5. He says, I speak of the husband and the wife. And then he says this, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ is the groom. The church is the bride. We are waiting for the bridegroom to come and take us home. Beloved, I hope that this somehow on this Valentine's Day will register with you. If you've never come to Christ, ask yourself the question, does it matter whether God loves you? Because if it doesn't matter, then he never will. Oh, he loves everybody. No, he loves everybody with beneficial love. The sunshine is shining on everybody today. The bad, the wicked, the sunshine is here. The rains will come. They'll bless everybody. That's his beneficent love. We call that common grace. And in common grace, you know things that you should do and should not do. There are things in common grace that you know better. It's called the natural law. When the German desperados were on trial at Nuremberg, they could not be tried by any, any human law except natural law. And that's what they appealed to, the prosecutors. They appealed to natural law, not the law of a nation because their law has, has changed. They voted different laws. But then the prosecutor said, but there is a natural law written in the heart and conscience of men. And by that law, you have sinned. And so they were all condemned. And so there is a beneficent law, common grace, but then there is a special call. Jesus put it like this. Many are called, few are chosen. And it's our job to preach this word. That's the means whereby people are changed. That's the, that gives the Holy Spirit the bullets to fire into the hide of elephants and rocks and break them and smash them. That's what God does in the gospel preaching. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, poorly do we speak of thee, but now how deeply do we appreciate thee. Oh Lord Jesus, we never outgrow our great need for you. And so Father in heaven, we ask you to bless us in this day. Give us loving hearts to love the unlovely just as you loved us. For we ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. There is an old hymn. We're going to sing a song, but there's a, a great hymn called O Thou in Whose Presence. From the Song of Solomon. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. O Thou in Whose Presence my soul takes delight. On whom in affliction I call. My comfort by day and my song in the night. My hope, my salvation, my all. Where dost thou, dear shepherd, resort with thy sheep to feed them in pastures of love? Say, why in the valley of death should I weep or alone in this wilderness rove? Oh, why should I wander in alien from thee? 
or cry in the desert for bread. Thy foes will rejoice when my sorrows they see, and they'll smile at the tears I have shed. And then this last stanza, he looks, and ten thousands of angels rejoice, and myriads wait for his word. He speaks, and eternity filled with his voice re-echoes the praise of the Lord. Dear shepherd, I hear, and I will follow thy call. I know the sweet sound of thy voice. Restore and defend me, for thou art my all, and in thee I will ever rejoice. Our hymn for closing is the hymn number 748. We'll just use the first and last stanza, 748. 748. face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you means the smile of God's face. He's not angry with you. And help you to hear his words whispered deep in your soul where only you and God live. Well done, good and faithful servant. I see you struggling in the mists and the mystery of life. Be not afraid. I am in the mist and I am in the mystery. And may God give you his perfect peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say because he lives I can face tomorrow.
Nice. 